Good morning, and thank you for joining God's Will Christian Fellowship Sunday School. Um, we uh, are here every Sunday at 9 a.m., and we thank you for joining us this morning. As always, we will be coming out of the standard lesson commentary. Um, uh oh. We're coming out of the standard lesson commentary, and um, let's go ahead and start with prayer. Amen. Amen. Almost gracious and heavenly Father, it's once again that we come before you. First of all, Lord God, we just want to thank you. Thank you for who you are in our lives individually and collectively. Lord God, we just ask that you forgive us of all our sins that we've committed knowingly and unknowingly. Lord God, we just ask that you just bless this word today, Lord God. Give to me what you would have your people to hear, Lord God. Heavenly Father, just continue to use me as a vessel, Lord God. And I'll be so mindful and so grateful to give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. What a beautiful day it is. Today's lesson is called Abiding Love. Amen. And we'll be coming from John 15, um, verses 4 through 17. Amen. Um, and so let us get started. Amen. Verse 4. John 15 again, verses 4 through 17. Verse 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for a friend. If you if you are my friends, if you are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. You you do not choose me but I choose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and th so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Amen. What a rich, what a rich passage of scriptures. Um, we will always say, I think my first lady and pastor always say, do not let familiarity rob you of a new experience today. Um, enjoyed, enjoyed um, studying this lesson. Um, our key verse for today is, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. Our lesson aims today, define how the vine slash branches metaphor describes our relationship to Christ. Connect love and obedience as the complementary elements in the Christian life and identify ways to abide in Christ more faithfully. Amen. Let us begin. So in our introduction, um, it talks about wired for relationships. Um, and what I really got out of that is um, I highlighted it here that I thought was the most important thing. And it says we are wired for relationships. 
we may find that those relationships are not always what we think and are definitely not what we need. And how many of us have been there where we've been in a relationship or had relationships? And I'm not just talking about um, husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriends. You could have best friend, good friends, um, sometimes even relationships with family members. Um, and we think that they're, they're what we want, but they turn out to definitely be bad relationships and they're not what we need. Um, our lesson today speaks of a different type of being connected. Um, the one between Jesus and his followers. And it says, how does this work though? And how can we be connected to him? So this is awesome. This is going to help us learn how we can be connected to Jesus and how we need to stay connected to him. Amen. Um, let's go into B, our lesson context. Um, John 15 is the center of a farewell discourse, a series of speeches and prayers given by Jesus during his last supper. Um, we know here he's actually beginning to, you know, prepare the disciples for his crucifixion and his departing of them. But he wants them to remember all the things that he has shown them, all the things that he has taught them, and to continue to keep those things in his their spirits and to use those things to continue to build the kingdom. Amen. It says, Jesus builds his case for mutual love by using common observations from the vineyard. The vineyard was a staple of agriculture in the ancient world. In the Bible, Noah is the first recorded grape grower, and human society has prized the fruit of the vine ever since. We know, like, if you've ever been to California and you've ever been to a vineyard, it's just, it's massive. I mean, you just see just grapes just growing and growing and growing, and the, 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 um, the vineyard, um, the owner of the vineyard, I mean, that, that's a, like a prized possession to have all these grapes growing so that they can make different types of wine. And if you've ever seen people, you know, go and they get in the, um, the huge buckets and barrels and they're stomping on the grapes and you would think like, I don't want anything that somebody has been stomping on. But at the end of the day, how they um, cultivate those grapes and nurture those uh, the, the juice of the grapes turn into a magnificent tasting thing, which is wine. Amen. Um, and then, but I'm a just, I'm a, I, I, I love just grapes in general. Um, my daughter is one of my daughter's mentors. Um, and when it comes to grapes, she has um, shown us we take grapes and we wash them and then we end up putting them in the freezer. And if you've never had a frozen grape and the red ones are my favorite, try it. A frozen grape is really refreshing. So it's not where grapes aren't just good for wine, but it's also good for uh, just in general and freeze them. Try a frozen grape and you'll tell me that how much you like frozen grapes. Amen. Um, it says the fruit thereby produced a source of um, substance year round with many of the harvested grapes being converted into raisins and wine for later consumption. Um, I like grapes. I mean, I like um, raisins, but I love a frozen grape better. It says one of the enticing descriptions of the promised land was its productive vineyards. And, you know, a productive vineyard probably not probably a productive vineyard allowed you to make money, allowed you to, you know, be able to uh, give to, to other people. And it was awesome to be able to do that. Amen. It says vineyards were a common sight throughout Galilee, Samaria, and Judah in Jesus's day. It says great vines would be pruned severely at a certain time of the year, leaving little more than a leafless branch leafless branchless stump that would be propped up with a rock or two all the old branches would be cut off and carried away providing valuable food fuel for the home's fire so not only was the vineyard um substance for um for food and for whatever and wine or whatever else they were going to make but after the pruning process and getting everything um taken off then the branches were used to have fire and fuel and to heat the homes amen and it says after new branches had grown a second pruning would occur 
um, to remove the smaller branches. This would allow the larger branches to produce bigger clusters of larger grapes. Such pruning was a part of cultivating the vines. Amen. And if you've ever seen that um, happening, you see how they prune off the smaller branches so that big, the, other, the bigger branches could produce bigger grapes. So sometimes when you go to the supermarket, you see that there's small grapes, you see that there's big grapes. And I love when I can get some of the big grapes, amen? So that was the process, amen? And that's the process that still currently happens today, amen? So let's get started. It says the vine and the branches, connected and fruitful. It says, remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I like this here. Jesus is telling them to remain in me. You can't bear fruit by yourself. You have to stay connected, amen? We have to stay connected to our Lord and Savior, amen? It says, neither can you bear fruit unless we remain in him. So, and he's not literally talking about apples and grapes and, and, and things like that. He's saying in his love, stay connected in his word, remain co committed to him, amen? It says, remain is translated in many ways. Stay, live in, so stay in God's word, live in God's word, let it nurture you, amen? It says, stay connected, you know, like, it's like a power source, right? So, like, these cameras that I'm sitting here talking to you in front of, I, they can't run unless they're connected into the wall, into the power source. It's the electricity, amen? So God is our electricity. The Holy Spirit, stay connected, amen? We got to stay connected in order to grow, amen? That's what he's saying. It says we cannot remain in the physical body of Jesus. We remain in Jesus when we follow his word, his teaching, and as a result of our relationship with him. We talk about that a lot, having a personal relationship with him. Each one of our relationships with Jesus is different. Nobody's relationship is the same, amen? And we have to remember that. There are times where people look at somebody and say, I wish my walk with Christ was the way their walk was, or I wish I could speak the way that they speak, or I wish I could teach or preach the way that they could teach or preach. But that's not, if God doesn't make us all, we're not robots, amen? He makes us all individuals and our individual relationships are just like that. It's our individual relationship, amen? And so we work on those, amen? And one way to work on our individual relationship with Jesus is to stay connected to him. As it says, through his word, through his teaching and being obedient, amen? Um, so then it says, the vineyard metaphor reassures readers even today that we will see the fruit of our relationship with Jesus when we remain faithful to him. And it's always great to see the fruit of our labors. Amen. When you've been working hard and, or you've been studying for a test or whatever it is and you get a good grade or you've been working on a project at work and it turns out successful, you want to always see the fruit of your labor. Amen. And that's what we need to do as we continue to study God's word, teach God's word, live in God's word. We want to see the fruit of our labor. And one way to see our fruit of our labors is to have more disciples come to Christ. Amen. More disciples want to be on this walk and on this journey and in this destination. Amen. Amen. Then it says, I, verse five, it says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That was, uh, that the last part of that verse, um, when it says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Literally, he's our nourishment. Amen. He is our food. He is our water. Apart from him, we can do nothing. It says, uh, I just need to read that verse again. It's really rich. It says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. 
So let's talk about that first part. It says, I am the vine. So he's like the nucleus. He's the nucleus, right? And it's like, and you are the branches. It's like being the heart and all the veins and all the arteries are pumping out of it, right? We are the branches, right? We're, tr we're trying to continue what he has started, right? And it says, if you remain in me, and I and you continue to stay connected, right? Continue stay connected, and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. I mean, how could you not bear much fruit staying connected to the source, staying connected to Jesus? And it says, but apart from me, you are nothing. So if you disconnect yourself from the source, right? You have no power. You have no power. I want to remain connected to Jesus. I want to stay connected because I want power. I want everything that he has for me. Apart from him, I am nothing. I can do nothing. It's like not having water. I mean, we know how you can live, a, you can live I think, like two weeks without food, but you must have water. Jesus is our water. He is our, 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 our source. He is our strength. Amen. And it says, the vine is the main above ground stalk of the plant. Each grape plant will have one vine, but many branches splitting off from it. Amen. It says the vine is the source of water and nutrients that come from the roots to nourish the branches and fruit. Yes, continue to nourish me, God. Continue to fill me. Amen. As long as I'm staying connected, I will continue to be nourished. I will continue to have fruit. I will be able to, you know, give to others what um, I'm receiving from the source. Amen. It says the branches need to stay connected to the vine if they are to live. We've got to stay connected to the vine if we want to live, not just physically, but definitely spiritually. We have to stay connected. Amen. And we always want to grow spiritually. We don't want to get in a place and stay content. Amen. You don't just want to be content like, oh, I've grown this much and that's good enough for me. No, we always want to continue to be resourceful and branching out and have a bigger part on this spiritual journey. Amen. And it says in the same way, the disciples, which are us, because that's what God has called us to be. God has called us to be disciples. So he's speaking to us. Not only is he literally speaking to his disciples, but he's also speaking to us. His word is always speaking to us because we are disciples for Christ. Amen. It says in the same way, the disciples will be ultimately connected to Jesus for life giving spiritual nourishment and leadership. If this relationship is strong, the natural, the natural result will be the production of fruit. We always want to give out good fruit. Good fruit is love, is, is hope, is, 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 um, it's long suffering. It's all those things that we talk about in Galatians. Is it Galatians 5, 22 and 23? I think that's it. That's either Galatians 5 or Galatians 6. I'm sorry. I can't remember which one it is, but it's 22 and 23 about bearing good fruit. Amen. Um, so then the next thing we have here is uh, uh, our uh, commentator wrote a little thing about being grounded in prayer. He's talking about taking a job for an organization that had many challenges and he realized that every day he would become tired and exhausted. But on some days he wasn't tired and exhausted by the end of the week. And so he said, however, what he noticed was that the weeks that he experienced the most fatigue was the, excuse me, was the most fatigue were those weeks where he sacrificed spending time with God. How many of us have been there where your week has gotten, your week gets so busy that you forsake spending the normal hours or the normal minutes that you spend with God and you feel like, you know what, this week was just exhausting because you, for, you forgot to stay connected to your source. And God is our source. And if we continue to stay connected, he will give us everything that we need. Amen. And sometimes when we're getting weary and when we're exhausted, we need to remember, let me stop and take a break and seek God and just spend time with him. And it's in those moments where we spend time with God that we get re-energized, we get re-motivated, we get re-encouraged. Amen. So remember, 
to take that time. If you're feeling downtrodden or whatever, stop, take a moment, take a break, get in your prayer closet, get in your space where you spend time with God and just let him begin to re-energize you, refresh you. Amen. And then you can continue about your day and then you won't feel as downtrodden and you won't feel as weary and you won't feel as exhausted because you've been, you stay connected to that source. We stay connected. We stay plugged in. Amen. And he just continues to refresh us every time. And then it says, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the very source of our life. Let me say that one more time. Jesus is the very source of our life. Staying connected to him is staying connected to him is not an option. It's a necessity. If you don't get anything else out of this lesson, take that with you. Jesus is the very source of our life. We are nothing without Jesus. Amen. And stay connected and staying connected to him is not an option. It's a necessity. We have to stay connected to our father. If we don't stay connected, like we just, like I just spoke about, you'll get exhausted. You'll give up. You'll become faithless. You'll just be, you know, you'll let the world begin to live your life by, by the world's means. And you'll forget about who is, who, who is our source. Amen. We'll forget about Jesus and we'll forget all about who has brought us to where we are today. Stay connected. He's a necessity that we need. We must live and depend on him. Amen. And not give up because when we begin to give up, that means we're not staying connected because we're allowing our ourselves and this 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 spit this body to take over and we don't want this body to take over we want to live in the spirit of Jesus amen and so stay connected we need to stay connected he's using the metaphor of, the, of being the vine and the branches of, of him being the vine and us being the branches to help us correlate and understand what he's trying to get us to understand that we need him we need Jesus at the end of the day that's what he's letting us know we need him he don't need us. We need him. And if we stay connected, just imagine how our lives will just continue to flourish and how our lives will continue to grow and how he will continue to use us. God will use us in manners that we would never think that he would use us. And we stop, we will begin to say, why does he choose me? And why is he using me? Because he sees something in us that we have never seen in ourselves. Amen. So stay connected to Jesus. He is a necessity that we must keep. He's a necessity. He's our food. He's our nourishment. He's our water. Amen. Stay connected. Amen. Keep going, but let me continue with the lesson. Amen. B, severed and withered. It says, verse 6, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burn. It says not all branches coming out of the vine are productive or even, or even survive. You know, I want to be a productive branch. Amen. If I'm going to be on this, if I'm in this journey and I'm walking this journey, why would you do anything that you're not productive in? You know, I, I say this to myself when I go to the gym. And I get up and, and I'm, I'm there at 6.30 in the morning. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't feel like being here. If I took the time to get up and be there at 6.30 in the morning, I need to make this workout productive. Anything that we do, we should make it be productive. And this Christian journey, why continue on the journey if you're not going to be productive in the journey? That doesn't even make sense, right? Why study if you're not going to really try to make an A on the test? Amen. Be productive in whatever you do. Definitely, if it's any work that we're doing for Christ, be productive in it. You know, get other people involved. Continue to study your word more. Amen. Be productive. It says some branches are visibly damaged in various ways or even dead. Others simply have no fruit well enough into the growing season, thus becoming like parasites that suck life-giving water and nutrients from the vine and its roots. Why, you know, and, and we talk about this a lot. 
with people just, you might have relationships that just suck so much energy out of you that make you so exhausted and they give nothing back. Sometimes those relationships aren't good for us because they offer us nothing. All they do is suck everything out of us, but there's no productiveness. They're not allowing us to flourish or whatever. They're taking everything out of us. We don't want to do that to Jesus. We don't just want to be takers and takers and takers. We want to not only just get, get what he has for us, but we want to take what he gives us and use it and give it to other people and give it to other areas, other areas of ministry, other areas of our lives, other areas of our friendships, other areas of our families, other areas or even our professional lives, every man, amen. Because don't think that everything that Jesus gives us is just to be for uh, spiritual, to be just in the church. We just supposed to take everything, we take his word, and we just use it in the church. That's the only place we use it. No, we're supposed to take his word and everything that he gives us, and we're supposed to apply it to absolutely every area of our lives, to our friendships, to our working relationships, to our children, to our husbands, to our parents, to wherever we can use it and make it fruitful. Amen. We want these things to be fruitful. That's where we're to use it. We're not supposed to just keep it inside the four walls of the church and say, okay, this is where I'm supposed to just be this, um, this um, spirit-filled person. I'm supposed to just shout at church. I don't shout nowhere else. Child, there's times I'll be shouting at home in the closet, in my shower, uh, sitting at my desk at home because, you know, pretty much everybody's working from home now. Wherever it is, I used to be at work. I used to have a stand-up desk, and I would listen to my spiritual music, and I'd be singing and dancing and shouting, and people would look, and they'd be like, oh, she's listening to her gospel music. We're supposed to use everything, all our resources that God gives us in every area of our lives. Amen. Don't just be a parasite and suck everything and keep it to yourself. Use it and flourish it. Flourish it. Amen. It says some branches are removed from the vine to allow the remaining branches more room to flourish. Sometimes we Sometimes we got to remove people from our lives or remove things from our lives so that we can flourish. Amen. That's what we need to do. Remove something. And it's hard to remove things from our lives that we want in our lives. But sometimes those things become such parasites that we have to remove them from our lives so that we ourselves can begin to flourish. Amen. It says, um, Fuel for fires are always in demand, but these branches seem to be a bonfire just to dispose of trash. This is an image of judgment. To be thrown into in, to be thrown into the fire is a negative judgment on the faithfulness and the disobedient. Um, and that's what we don't want to be, be. We don't want to be faithless and we don't want to be disobedient. Amen. We don't want to be branches that are used to for fire, for fuel, for fire. Amen. We want to be branches that are fueled because we're having the fruit from the Holy Spirit to have us out there just totally gaining access to people that need us. Amen. That need the word of God. You know, we can never have too much word of God. You know, you can get it from reading the word yourself. You can get it from um, going to different conferences or reading different books and literatures and church or whatever, but we always constantly want to be seeking God's will for our life. And one way to do that is staying connected. He is the source. If we stay connected to him, we can't go wrong. Amen. Stay connected. Amen. Verse seven, it says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Um, we <laughs> talked about this. I mean, we've heard this verse before and we've heard it many times in the Bible where if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. That just absolutely doesn't mean everything that I go to God in prayer, I'm going to get. Everything that I ask for, for, God, for from God in prayer does not mean what that I'm going to forget. It's not like a genie lamp and he's, you rub it three times and all your wishes come true. Anything that we ask God, should we should know it should be already according to his will. And we would ask 
ask it in his will because we know what God's will is for our lives. So that's what that means. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But it has to be according to God's will. Not my will, but God's will. Amen. It says, this means to have our ways of thinking and ways of acting guided by the teachings of Jesus. To live in Christ is to live with his commands and teaching as our chief influence. Amen. God is our chief influence. Anything that we do, we should be doing it because we know that it makes God look good. We don't do stuff to make ourselves look good. And anything that he does for us, we should always give all honor and glory to him. Amen. Anything that we do is for him. We don't go around teaching and preaching for our self's worth. We do it to bring others into the community and into the kingdom for God's worth. We want to bring more disciples. That's what he called us to do. Bring more disciples into this following. Amen. So that there will be more people saved. Amen. That's what we want. We want people to be saved. We want not only for them to be saved, but then as they become saved, to walk the walk, to talk the talk, to live this life. Amen. And then to go out and get more disciples. Amen. It says, understanding this helps us to know what Jesus meant when he promised that we can ask whatever we wish and expect it will be done or referenced in, into prayer. It says, asking for good things may go against God's will and thus may, may not be given to us. Sometimes we pray for things that that God is, is that it's not in his will and they're not going to be given to us. And I know, trust me, I know that's a hard pill to swallow because I have been there and sometimes I feel like I'm still there that I have asked for things and it just doesn't happen. Obviously, it's just not God's will. But that means I always say if a no from God means that he has something even better for me than I can't even imagine. Amen. So a no means he probably had not probably he has something better for us than we can absolutely imagine. Amen. It says in all cases, such asking and promise answering is only for those who are deep in the mindset of Jesus. We have to be deep in the mindset of Jesus when you go and even ask anyway. Because if you're just asking for to be boastful or to be braggadocious or whatever, trust me, you are not going to get whatever it is that you're asking for. Because anything that we do for Christ, only, only things that we do for Christ will last. So when we're asking for things, we want to be asking for things that are in his will. Amen. It says if you are... If we are abiding as he asks, we will not ask something that is clearly contrary to the will of the Lord. We won't ask any for anything that is not of God's will. If you're in God's, if you're in God's will and you're in relationship with God, you already know you won't ask for anything that is not con you won't you will not ask for anything that is not contrary to his will. You will ask for things that are contrary to his will. Amen. Um Amen. So verse eight, it says, this is my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Amen. And I like what um, my Bible says here. Um, it says many people try to do good, be honest and do whatever is right. But Jesus says the only way to live a truly good life is to stay close to him. We got to stay close. Once again, that's really, he's our source. He's our, we stay connected to that power. So he's like, here's the power. We are the plug. Stay connected to him. It says, like a branch attached to the vine. Apart from him, our efforts are unfruitful. Apart from Jesus, our efforts are unfruitful. He says, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Showing ourselves that we're, we're listening to what his word is telling us to do. It says, Jesus summed this up in three ways. First, this faithful remaining and resulting obedience brings glory to our Father. We always want to bring glory to the Father. Our, amen. It says our actions reflect on our Lord. Faithful, gracious actions bring God glory. Faithful, gracious actions bring God glory. Amen. It says second, faithful remaining will bear much fruit. Will bear much fruit. This must be evidence of a godly life. 
We want to walk a godly life. Amen. And we will bear much fruit if we do that. And once again, here and earlier when I was talking, here we are. Fruits of the Spirit, um, which is, is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I wasn't for sure if it was 5 or Galatians 5 or was it 6, but it's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It talks about all the bearing much of fruits of the Spirit. It says it is also the reproduction of one's life and the creation of new disciples. If we're bearing so much fruit, if we're using fruits of the spirit, we can't help but bring the creations of new disciples. People will come to us and say, you know, when you're looking down and you're looking lowly, how can you continue to be um, in a happy place? How can you continue to be uplifted? Um, and it's because you're having fruits of the spirit because you are staying connected to that source. You're to that source. We're remaining faithful to God and he's able to use us when we remain faithful to him. Amen. And when we remain faithful to him, he uses us and then we're able to be um, disciples for him and then we're able to go out and touch others and then others are asking how can you live like that when you know when things aren't going well for you but when we know who our source is we can explain to them you know what I stay connected to God in all things good bad or indifference when I remain connected to him and I'm saying I remain connected to him through my prayer life I can remain connected to him by studying his word I remain connected to him by just some Sometimes just having those Zen moments, waiting for God to speak to me, me being silent, me being still, me being quiet and waiting to hear what God has to say to me. Sometimes we just need to be quiet. Sometimes we just need to be quiet, be still, and let God speak to us. Let God move. And then we will know how to move, how to react, how to respond. Sometimes we spend so much time talking and praying and asking for what we want that we need to have quiet, still moments. Take that quiet, still time and see what God would have us to do. See how God would talk to us and what God wants us to do. So remember, remaining connected also means sometimes being quiet and being still. We're still connected to that source, but sometimes we just need to remove ourselves and let God do the work and use us. And it's in those quiet times and in those quiet moments that we can hear from here more clearly because we're quiet, we're still, and those are the greatest moments that we can begin to see what God would have us to do, how God would have us to reach out and gain more disciples. Amen. Amen. Um, let's see. Um, then it says the third item was Jesus summary. Doing this is the core of being a disciple of Christ. Disciples, though now a churchy word is similar to the English word, a student. Jesus is the teacher. I love this. It says Jesus is the teacher from whom we learn. He is the teacher. We never outgrow. We are Jesus disciples for life. And I think that's what I've been trying to get across is we are Jesus' disciples for life. He's the teacher from whom we learn. We learn from what he went through on his walk on this earth. We, we learn from him. We learn from mistakes that have happened from like his, the, the mistakes that his disciples made, the st mistakes that others made in the, the Bible, mistakes like David made. But in the midst of making those mistakes, they, their lives grew and they turned because they turned back to Jesus and they asked for forgiveness and he was able to use them. We have to remember, he's a teacher. It says like here, he's a teacher we can never outgrow. Even when we make mistakes, amen, and we go to God and we repent and we ask for forgiveness, that's still a learning lesson. It, whatever we went through, it's, it, we can learn from those mistakes and we can never outgrow God's love for us. We can never outgrow his teaching methods. Amen. He helps us on this journey. He doesn't leave us out here to just wallow in the wilderness. That's why we have his word. His word helps grow us. His word helps nourish us. His word is, like I said earlier, he is our source. He is our nourishment and that's what his word is. His word is our source. His word is our nourishment and it helps us through those hard times those bad times even through the good times there's there's some stuff in here that is so up 
uplifting. God's word is uplifting. It encourages us. It enriches us. And so when we use that in our lives, we can't help but continue to grow in God, to grow in this Christian journey. Amen. We are disciples for life. Amen. To be a disciple for life is rich right there. He says we are Jesus disciples for life. Amen. He can't get rid of us. Amen. And we should not want to get rid of him. We should want to constantly be a part of this journey. Amen. Because being a part of this journey continues to help us to love, to grow, to flourish, to, you know, to be better than we were yesterday. You know what I'm saying? I want to be better today than I was yesterday. And I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. Amen. So that's what God's word does for us. Help us to be better each day, to be a better Christian to be a better person. Amen. Amen. So then let's keep going. So verse nine, it says the Lord and his friends, loving, joyful, and obedience. And verse nine says, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. It says, Jesus began with the most fundamental dynamic in the universe. God's love. How great is that? Jesus testified to the Father's love for him throughout the book of John. This love is demonstrated by the authority the Father gave the Son and the Father's revealing and the Father's revealing his plans to the Son and the Father also loves the Son for his willingness to give his life for sinners. We are so grateful that G we have to be so grateful that Jesus loved the Father enough to not only give his life, life, but to listen and demonstrated his love by dying on the cross. And it says the Father also loved the Son for his willingness to give his life for sinners. We are so grateful that that's what Jesus did for us. But not only that, we have to be so grateful and thankful for his obedience because if he decided to say, you know what, I don't, I don't got time to be dying for these folks because at the end of the day, they're going to keep sinning and they're going to keep doing what it is that they're going to do. But he was faithful and he loved his father enough and he was obedient enough to go and give his life for us on the cross. So that's when we have to say there is, well, we're going to get to that verse later on, I almost there is no greater love. There is, I'm just going to talk about it now. There is no greater love than for someone to lay down their life for us. And that is what Jesus did. So we have to remain in this love. He's talking about as the father has loved him. He knew how great his father loved him. He says, so I have loved you. Jesus loves us. Amen. He absolutely loves us. And we want to remain in his love. Amen. It says, God's love never changes and it never fails. You know, we've been in relationships where, you know, you thought that this person you just love, you could not be without, you just had to have them in your life. And at the end of a, at the end of months or years, the relationship just falls apart. The love just, the love leaves. Amen. But God loves, does, God's love doesn't leave us. God's love doesn't fail us. Amen. So when we are thinking about love, we have to remember there's one person who will love us unconditionally and will always love us unconditionally. And that's our father. That's Jesus, our father, our heavenly father. He will love us unconditionally, no matter what, no matter what trials, no matter what tribulations, no matter what it is that we do, we seek him and ask him for forgiveness. His love will never fail us. Man's love will fail us, but Jesus' love will never fail us. Amen. It says, all these things that describe the Father's incredible love for Jesus describe, for love for Jesus describe in turn Jesus' incredible love for his disciples. He loved his disciples. Amen. And he wanted to make sure that everything that they learned by walking with him and going on these journeys with them were for a reason. It was to continue for them to continue his legacy. Amen. It says yet experience that love fully requires believers to remain in Jesus's love. We need to remain in Jesus.
Jesus his love. We need to remember, excuse me, we need to remain in his love by remembering the sacrifice that he made for us. That's a huge love. That's a big love. Amen. It says, verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. How easy is that? Keep my command. And my command, his command is just for us to love. If you keep my command, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and I remain in his love. So it's reciprocated. Amen. It's reciprocated. Jesus, Jesus, the father loved Jesus. Jesus loved the Father. Jesus loved us. Now we love him. It's reciprocated. Continue to reciprocate that love, that command of love. Continue to reciprocate that. Amen. It says Jesus asked them to consider that he always kept his father's commands. And even keeping his father's commands, and when we can keep even our, when we keep when keeping his father's commands not only showed how much he loved him, but he also showed his obedience. Amen. But that is just that's great when you have when you have obedience and you have love and you have faithfulness and all that can bring joy. Amen. And it says um, he kept his father's commands and never departed from his deep abiding relationship with his father. When we are in relationship with Jesus, when we are in relationship, it goes, I can't even, it, it, it's so deep. And like I said, everybody's relationship is different. But when you are in relationship with Jesus, it's like, you don't want to, you don't want to disappoint. You, you want to stay fruitful. You want to stay obedient. You want to stay in his will. Um, in, in, in being in relationship with God, like when, when you think about what, what 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 is your relationship with Him, and when you're in relationship with Him, sometimes it for me ugh, it can bring you to tears because it's like it's something you you can't explain. It's something you don't. It's an experience that only you can ex that you can. It's, it's your relationship. It's not somebody else's relationship, but it's something that you love having you love having your personal relationship with God because it's different than any other relationship that you will ever experience and to think about having that personal relationship with him it makes you want to do better it makes you um want people to understand this re love relationship that you have with a heavenly, your heavenly father. I can't, I can't even explain it, but there's nothing like, there's nothing like having a relationship with God. That's all I can say. There's nothing like it. I can't put it into, it's hard to put into words because it's my own relationship and I, I treasure it. I nourish it and I, I appreciate it. And, um, he, he, he's just my all and I thank him. I don't know. Anyway, Let's continue. Um, it says, um, yet experience that love fully requires believers to remain in Jesus's love. Amen. So just remain in it, remaining in his love is just huge. Amen. That's all I, I, I don't know. I can't even put it into words. So let's go to verse 10. It says, um, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I think that's what I've just, I just read that. It says, Jesus asked them to consider that he always kept his father's commands and never departed from his deep abiding relationship with his father. Sorry, I just did verse 10 again. It says we should remain. I mean, we should remember that our relationship with God, there is not a progression from command, command keeping to being loved. We are not loved because we are obedient. We are loved because we are God's creatures. We cannot earn God's love. The relationship begins with the internal love of the father's love for us. Just as the father's love for his son has no beginning or no end. <coughs> it says we are obedient because we are loved and, we, and return that love through keeping the father's command. That is how we remain in the Father's love. Amen. It's 
Sorry, my throat got a little dry. Amen. So that is rich right there. That this is how we remain in the Father's love. It says we are obedient because we love him and we return that love through keeping his commands. Amen. Let me hear it. Um, and then it says, verse 11, I have told you this. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I love how my Bible, um, um, commenta the commentary in my Bible, it says, when things are going well, we are elated. We are excited. We're overjoyed. It says, when hardship comes, we sink into depression. But true joy transcends these waves of circumstances. Joy comes from a consistent relationship with Jesus Christ. It says when our lives are intertwined with his, we will, he will help us walk through adversity without sinking into deliber, deliber, deliberating lows and manage prosperity without moving into set into without moving into the deceptive highs. The joy of living with Jesus Christ daily keeps us level-headed, no matter how high or low our circumstances are. That's what real joy is. Real joy is remaining, remaining intertwined with Jesus. Amen. It says seeking him for all things, when whether it's whether we're in a good place or in a low place, we can have joy because we know that at the end of the day, God is looking out for us. We know we are connected to him. Amen. And even when we have those low moments, he helps us from going seeking way, way, way down. And we can find joy knowing that God's got me. I have joy knowing that no matter how I'm feeling or whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, I have joy joy knowing that Jesus has me. Amen. And I am in his bosoms. Amen. I can rest and I can rule and abide in his word and in, in him and in his walk and in this journey. Amen. As long as I have Jesus, I have joy. As long as I got Jesus, I have joy. Amen. Amen. Then it says, verse 12, great sacrificial love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Give, it says in my Bible, it says, we are to love one another as Jesus loved us. And love, as Jesus loved us, and he loved us enough to give his life. He loved us enough to give his life. His command for us is to just love one another. How easy is that? That's so easy to, for us to just continue to love one another. Amen. It says, therefore, this command is one of the core elements of being a Christian. This is a core element of being a Christian. It says there are many deep and complex issues to the Christian faith, but this is not one of them. When asked whom we must love, Jesus told a story of actively loving our enemies. And we can find that in Luke uh, chapter 10 verses, uh, Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. If we love our enemies, who are we entitled not to love? If you can love your enemies, who can you not love? Amen. And that's how great this command is. Love one another. We are to love one another. Amen. And I love here. Um, how it says, give all the love you can and then try to give a little more. Give all the love you can. This is what's in my little Bible um, in the commentary. It says, give all the love you can and then give a little more. Amen. And how much you're like, oh my God, I'm already giving enough. We'll give some more. Amen. Because this next verse lets us know, verse 13 Greater love has no man than this, to lay down one's life for friends. We may never have to lay down our life. We may never have to lay down our life for anyone. Amen. That was the ultimate sacrifice. That's the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. But we may never have to do that. And so then it says, he clarified that this love has no limitation. 
We should love one another even to the point of dying for one another. That is actually a tall order indeed. Once again, if you are loving and you think you're giving all this love, give a little more. We can never give too much love. We can never love somebody enough. Who goes around saying, well, I love you too much or I've loved you enough. We can never love too much. Even if we never have to lay down our life for somebody, we can never love too much. Amen. And then um, it says, um, then there is no greater love than this. And we know during um, Easter, we always sing that song, no greater love, that Jesus, he gave his life for you and me. He died on Calvary. There is no greater love. There is no greater love for a man to lay down his life for us. Amen. That was the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus gave up his life for us. Amen. So for him to ask us to just love one another, to love our enemies, to can love even more than you loved yesterday, to love even more than you can love tomorrow, continue in his love because Jesus, God is love. Amen. Um, it says, uh, verse 14, it says, you are my friends. If you do not, if you are my friends, it says, excuse me. It says, you are my friends. If you do what I command, he said, we are his friends. If we do what I, he commands, it says, we are G Jesus's friends motivated out of love to do what God requires of us. Amen. That's all he does. He requires us to love one another. And he called us his friends. Amen. He called us his friends. You can't call everybody a friend. Amen. He's calling us his friends. Then verse 15, I'm kind of rushing because time is getting short. Um, verse 15, it says, chosen messengers. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what he does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father. I have made known to you. He said, a servant ultimately obeys out of fear. We're not a servant. We're God. We're his friend. We don't obey him out of fear. We obey him because we love him. We obey him because we respect him. We obey him because we care about him. We obey him because God is love and obedience is better than sacrifice. And so when we do everything that God's will has us to do, we can't help but think that's the reason God can call us his friends because we're doing what he requires of us. We don't go out and do our own thing. We go and do what he asked of us to do. We do it within his will. So he can call us a friend. Amen. He says, um, I, because a servant does not know his master's business. God shares his business with us because we are his friends. We are his disciples. He wants to use us to go and get more disciples. He wants to use, he wants our lives to be a representation of what it looks like to be a good Christian, to be a good person, to be on the battlefield for him. He says, a friend is one whom a person feels deep affection for and demonstrates loyalty. We are faithful and committed to him. That's why he says, I can call you a friend. He, we're, we're friends. He calls us a friend. Amen. He said, Jesus disclosed that friendship is the relationship he has been working towards throughout his three year ministry with his disciples. He's been working towards friendship with them. He wanted them to know that he was committed to them. He was loyal to them and that they could demonstrate the same thing. They could reciprocate the same thing back to him. It says their knowledge has grown because of Jesus' many revelations of the nature of the Father, of the plans he and the Father had for the future. It said um, the disciples are insiders, friends considered worthy of receiving everything Jesus had learned from his Father. 
I want to be an insider. Amen. I want to receive everything that he has learned from his father and be able to give that to other people. Amen. To be an insider in this journey. Amen. We want to take everything that Jesus has left for us in regards to his word. And we want to be insiders and be able to use that to give to others. Amen. Let's be an insider. Um, and let's continue to be made his friend. Amen. Then it talks about, uh, there's a story, Jesus is a true friend. Um, didn't, it was just an okay thing. Um, let's see, it said, uh, Jesus, God in the flesh exemplified what a true friend is. If Christ was willing to lay down his life for the world, then we all owe him our lives too. Amen. That's a true friend. He exemplified what a true friend is. Then verse 16, it says, you did not choose me. But I choose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father gives you. Sorry, this verse is very, this is very personal for me. Because when I was praying and trying to see what God would have me to do, and if I was supposed to be more than just a teacher, but God called me to be more than that, this was um, one of the things he said to me outside of other scriptures that he gave me to confirm my calling. He told me this. He said, he gave me these words and he said, you didn't choose me, but I choose you. And if there's any time in your life where you're like, why would, oh, this is a mess. I'm sorry. Why did, why would he choose me? And you have to remember he chose we, he, he said, I did not, you, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And for God to choose us is huge because for me, I always look like, but I'm not worthy. And it doesn't matter how I feel. He chose me. Um, even when I have moments of feeling unworthy and that this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing or how can... I'd be helping somebody because, you know, I don't think that I'm always doing right or I'm always doing what God has told me to do or wanted me to do. You get those confirmations where you're you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. And, you know, I got kind of a, a, a sweet little thing happened at church last Sunday. A, a, one of the ladies at the church, you know, said that um, she likes to hear me talk or speak or whatever and everything that I say I get from God it's not myself um, anytime I have to speak or preach or teach I I seek God in doing all things because I can't I know that if I I if, if it's self-inflicted then nobody's gonna get it you know what I'm saying then there's no fulfillment of that but anytime I get up to talk I, I pray and I ask God to use me because at the end of the day, when I ask him to use me, I know all honor and glory goes to him. So just know sometimes you may not think you're doing enough or you think you may not be saying enough, but people are watching, people are paying attention and you'll find out in ways that you never thought you would find out to know that I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing and God, there's a reason you chose me to do this work and I'm appreciative of it. And so that's what he's saying here. He, he, he said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I'm grateful. He said that you will continue to bear much fruit. And sometimes we don't think that the fruit we bear is, you know, Christian fruit. And sometimes we do. We we get sidetracked or whatever it is, and our fruit isn't a representation, a representation of God. But just know that God creates in us a clean heart, and he will renew within us a right spirit, amen. And he will wash away all those things if we ask for forgiveness, and if that's what we want. 
Amen. So that we can continue to bear much fruit. Amen. Because that's what we want to bear. We want our lives to be a representation of the fruit that we bear. And that fruit is all the fruit that Jesus Christ requires us to bear. We want to be, we want to be loving. We want to be caring. We want to be nurturing. We want to be compassionate. We want to be we want to be friendly. We want to um, just continue to just walk in the walk and talk the talk that he has given us. Amen. Then um, I've gone long and it says um, we are expected to bear fruit. The vine of Jesus continues to produce the fruit of the new disciples and spiritual growth. Even today, we will do so in the future, though this requires effort on our part. It says everything we need for our work comes from Jesus, not from our own power. Amen. We need to remember that everything we need for our work comes from Jesus, not our own power. Amen. Because then it will be self-induced, self-glorifying. And I never want to do anything that doesn't glorify my master. Everything that I ask, I ask in his name and I ask him to give it to me because I don't ever want to be that I think that it's my own power that has set me to teach, that has set me to walk, talk, preach his word. Everything I do is to glorify God. And then verse 17, it says, this is my command, love each other. If we do nothing else, we can love each other. Amen. Sometimes it gets hard. Sometimes Christians go through people condemning us. Sometimes we see, we have seen a lot of hatred in this world, but at the end of the day, all God requires is for us to love one another. This is his command. Amen. I want to say thank you so much. And there is no greater love than for him to lay down his life for us. Amen. There is no greater love. Amen. So like I said, if you think you're loving too much, love a little more. We ask that you, <clears throat> excuse me, join us today at 12 o'clock. We are at 3500 Forest Street. And we ask that you join us in service today. And once again, I thank you for sharing in this Sunday school lesson with me and we ask that you just continue to be with us on every Sunday as we continue to have Sunday school at nine o'clock and we have church services at noon. Thank you. God bless and have a wonderful day.